Ted Craig after hours, man, is a uh, a legend in the game, a pioneer, and also possibly a time lord. Uh, man, if you've been following the hip hop journeys for over these years, man, you've seen this man, you heard his name, and you definitely heard his music. One time for said G. Peace, my brother. Peace and love. Peace and love. Yo, man, like it's such a pleasure to have you here because it's just once again a testament to the fact that a lot of people who put in that work early in the hip hop game. They are still here with us. They are still here to tell these stories. And uh, you definitely got a phenomenal one, man. So, uh, you know, for those who don't know, you, you started as a DJ. Um, and you went to the legendary D. Wick Clinton High School, correct? Yeah, me and Keith went to Clinton. So is that where y'all first met? Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I was talking to one of me and Keith's friends, a boy D. Rob the other day. And he was talking about how Keith slid his way over into the, uh, the athletes, the athletes table, you know. Because only the athletes were sitting there, but Keith was the only non-athlete. This, this is, you know, he just got up in there. He was just regular. Everybody just knew him. That was Keith. Yo, and the crazy thing is, like, probably the time you guys were in Dewitt Clinton, I was going to PS95. I lived in Tracy Towers. So to know that I was that close to greatness by proxy is an amazing thing, man. D. Wick Clay was so dope. They used to have these after-school uh, summer programs that, you know, if your parents were going at work all day, you can come there, you at least get a decent meal. Maybe they let you swim. You know what I mean? It was the good old days. Yeah. Cool Keith, no, he had about 15 lunch ticket books. <laughs> 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 yeah. He's doing lunch after lunch. He had the lunch ticket. Then he had to sell a few. <laughs> Always with the hustle. So coming from the DJ world... <laughs> Nah, 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 we sell the weed on the corner, keep, that's how we used to be a Clinton. They'd be like, yo, lunch tickets, lunch tickets. That's good as gold. <laughs> it's set, you go get you a pack of cookies after you sell the lunch ticket. Yo, you got to let it grind, man. So, yo, so so from DJing to rapping, so you meet Keith, um, you know, and you were part of, like, a large DJ crew. Uh, cool Keith was part of another rap crew. And what made y'all decide to, like, you know, break off and form something together? Well, like Keith said, even though we knew each other's, we knew each other's, but Keith wound up at the house just by accident, just by flowing with the people he was flowing with at the time. They wound up at the house doing early production with uh, my brother and keyboard money, Mike. Uh, he didn't know he was coming to my house. He had no idea. And I walked and I saw Keith. And Keith had his, uh, he was doing his thing with his partner. Then you had Chris and them doing their thing with his group. And uh, I was just a DJ and I just had, you know, the equipment up there, me and Mo Love. And then uh, what happened was at that time when Keith and them was first started doing their thing, that's when like the jingle thing was big, like commercial jingles, they was putting them on the records like Inspector Gadget. But then Marley, I put an end to that era when he put out The Bridge by Shan. Mm -hmm. To the bridge, King's Bridge. It got hip hop started getting hard again. So Keith had a desire to do harder production, just like Chris. So Scott LaRock, the late Scott LaRock and my brother, they was always up on the, uh, newest and most complex or uh, intricate musical equipment. So they told me about that in 12. You know, at the time I had a, a decent, decent job and uh, I was able to acquire an SB12 through the blessings of my aunt, DJ Mo Love's mother. Uh, she co-signed for the machine for me. You know, it was $5,000 at that time. You know, 5,000 had a little weight on it back then back in the early, you know, in the 80s. Right. 5,000 a day is a napkin you blow your nose on. Back then, they had a little weight. So I got the SB12, learned how to use it. Uh, keyboard even helped me learn it. And then uh, the desire came to be stronger, harder production, less musical. So the transition left from the keyboard money mic to me. And Keith's partner was a little bit 
let's say, difficult to work with. So uh, me and Keith kind of made a deal, you know. He was going to, because I, I wanted to also start rapping. I just didn't want to DJ. So Keith was going to help me learn how to rap. And we was going to do an album together. And then he'll do his thing. I'll do my thing. And, you know, we'll always be ultra magnetic. We'll always come back and do albums. But that was always the adventure. Got you. Like Keith was basically helping me out, and I was helping him out. So we both was, you know, killing two birds with one stone. Understood. Now you talk about the SP twelve hundred, iconic piece of machinery, especially like you know for the sounds that forged a lot of early hip hop records. And with the new equipment, you know, granted you get some quicker shortcuts, but there is some edge and some complexity that is lost because some of the new stuff is so easy. How does, how does that stand, that piece of equipment stand, in your opinion, compared to the new equipment that's out now? I'll be honest, the new, the new equipment has a SV12 setting in it. Like if you want that grit sound, you, can, you know, cause all of this is just less bits. Like the SV12 was I think 12 or 14 bit. And now these things are like 16 to 24 bit samplers. So you can reduce your rate in, in products like the machine, you know. See, I'm always into the technical aspects of it. Like a lot of people have these machines, but they don't even know how to, you know, they don't know the full functions of them. But uh, I tell, I'll be honest, if they had these machines back then, it would have been scary. The stuff you do through the day, mm -hmm. Now I said, do you still have your original SP? No, no, I've been, I've been lost that SP. Uh, actually, once I got the twelve hundred, I gave up the the original SP twelve I had with two point five sampling, and you had the the floppy disk like this to save it. <laughs> <laughs> it just like this to save. Two seconds of sampling, right, you know. <laughs> megabyte at best, you know, back then. And then it had to be double-sided because if you use the full 2.5, you have to take this, this out, and then turn it over and save the rest. Oh, you know what? And it just hit me. Yeah, you're not even talking about the the, the smaller. Exactly. You talking about the that was the, that was the improvement when you got the regular, even though this is considered big today, but when you got the regular credit size, Standard hard disk that would be improving, but the first one, the first SB12, your floppy disk was this big. I don't even think I've seen one of those SPs that had that like in person. I've only oversaw like the other disk, but yeah, damn, you're right. I, 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 homies used to have the Commodore 64 back in the days, and they were like, they were like, take three of those discs yeah. to load Spy Hunter, you know what I mean? Like, it was such a, a painful yeah. task. But but that's what made it fun. You, it made you get creative because you had to learn how to manipulate that little bit of time. And that was one of the things I specialized in was manipulating that little bit of time in the machine. So when it did turn to the 1200 and you went to 10 seconds, it was like, you know, the heavenly gates opened up and the angels started singing. Oh. <laughs> No, but it said it's so ill, but that you know that the fact that you know the sample time was so short back in the day that it really made y'all have to forge your creativity and really you know do so much with so little, and and I think that's why those records hit differently because like I mean hip hop is a whole culture of doing the most with the bare minimum, and you know those it, that stuff made you know really pushed that it seemed. Yeah, but it just even was it just the machines. Like a lot of the studios weren't even like perfected. Like uh, Keith could tell you, we used to go in the studio and like one week we can lay Cynthia and sync the drum machine up and put new stuff down. Then the next week the Cynthia wouldn't work. You use a click track. Then the next week that wouldn't work. So a lot of times we just I literally had to just fly beats in while taping, you know, and uh. Also, uh, we did that with Eagle Tripping because like uh, we did Eagle Tripping actually before I had the machine. And once again, we did a version uh, that uh, since I didn't have the SB12, uh, we went to a studio and Keyboard Money Mike actually did it. 
And the thing was, it came out very stringent. We didn't like it. So I went, I took Mo Love in the studio and we just literally had Mo fly the record in to the tape. No simply nothing. He was just cutting. And if it goes off, the engineer stopped it and just start over. So it was a whole thing. We knew what we wanted. We wanted to be hard, edgy, less musical. And that's why we took control of it. So, you know, that's what it was. And, yo, and it definitely crafted a diamond, you know, in the form of, uh, you know, critical beatdown. And the crazy thing is, like, you know, a lot of people don't understand how long it used to take sometimes for albums to come together back then. Like, I remember, you know, uh, Greg was explaining to me, uh, Greg Nice, when I smooth, like how long it took from the first records they recorded to where you get that self-titled album. So when did the process of critical beatdown begin from like the, the you know, what year did y'all start recording to where we eventually heard it in 88? Well, we started recording back in like, towards the end of 85. So 85, 86, uh, we did a, our first thing that we did together was actually once again, a keyboard money mic production, it was called Space Groove. You know, and it was, uh, you know, it was had a lot of music in it. You know, but, uh, uh, then we did, like I said, I took control of the production and we did the uh, Make You Shake demo in the house, the four track version that you find on Aaron Fuchs's uh, basement tapes, Tough City Records. And that, that's fly, that's hip hop. Uh, that, we did the, uh, the DNA promo, Mo just cutting up on the turn, no drum machine at all, Mo just cutting on the turntables. Me and Keith had an old regular tape recorder, you know, the little cheap, Tape recorder mics, you remember those? You press the red button. Yep. We had that and we rhymed over the beat. So we did a lot of things prior to, to before critical beat down because actually, if we had put, and I was just saying our B size, but now, now that you mention it, if we had put all the stuff we did previously before critical beat down, along with all the B sides and, and singles we had, it would have to been a double compilation, a co compilation album with just songs we had already done. It wouldn't have been nothing new. So that was the hard thing when we did Critical Beat Down was figuring out uh, what we was going to keep, you know, outside of obviously Eagle Tripping, you know, because of the noise and impact that record had. But it became like, what do we keep? How do we create a new album without losing the fan base we've been acquired so it became hard and we had to certain songs like mentally mad was left off mm. you know but uh, obviously it worked out for the best yeah and it was a record too um i know that uh you know leo cohen was really a big fan of that ended up not making the uh making the final album it was just i think it was something to the effect you didn't like the way it was mixed some with love in the title uh has some some stabs in it too like uh what was it um, called it was called to give you love that album didn't oh, make, there you go that album didn't make the wonder bread plastic cover that that was out of the question see what it was if if we could have gotten that record if that record would have sound like it did in the studio at that time mm -hmm. if it would have sound like that outside the studio we probably had a big record but it just didn't sound like that outside that room was it one of those days where like y'all left when it was getting mixed and the the, the No, the, no, no. We we were there. It just sounded for like I said, the record sounded so phenomenal. Leo Cohen stepped out of his session and came into the room. And later on, Keith was laughing about it because me and uh the guy Diamond International, we told him when Leo asked us where we signed, we said, Yeah, and we started looking at each other, giving each other's pounds like we had this big gold record. Keith later on was making jokes about it. Like, <laughs> y'all was creating a monster and you turned down a, a, a possible great deal. But it just didn't sound like that. If it sounded like that, but to be honest, 
the record didn't sound like that. So we all probably wouldn't have signed this. He would have took it into his office and put it in and said, what happened? <laughs> what happened? Did y'all change the mix? Did y'all change the mix? This ain't it. Uh, get, get, get out of my office. Get out. <laughs> but you know i guess everything happens for a reason and like the body of work you know stands tall and y'all have some of the most creative hooks in rap history even if, like sometimes you only have to hear a song once and you still know it like uh two brothers with jack said the caddies fly san francisco harvey um when you guys are in the lab cooking up who comes up with most, like, what is the process in putting together an ultra record? You know, like, is it concept first, hook first, rhymes first? I mean, obviously the beats are there. You know, how does how do these things form? Well, it starts with the beat. So we will all decide which beat we was going to use. And then as far as, like, there's a... Uh, hooks and stuff like that and where the record was going, that was always Keith. That was like, wherever he took it, that's where the record went, you know? <laughs> and, and he came up with all those crazy hooks, you know? It's rare if I came up with a hook, but Keith came up with most of the hooks. Does it ever blow your mind how well the, the music has aged? You know what I'm saying? Because like sometimes you listen to something and it sounds like a particular year, but it literally seems like you guys had your finger on the pulse of what was going on 30 years later and, and nailed it to where they like, I mean, the stuff still sounds good. It shows. I saw Ultra Magnetic MC's performance, South by Southwest. It was something that I think Red Bull put together. And I think it was like the, one of the first times you guys played South by Southwest in a long time. Ghetto Boys was also on the bill. And just to see the crowd just give it up and rock to these joints. And half those people, there's, there was no way half these people were even alive when, you know, Critical Beatdown came out. But good music is good music. Does it ever blow your mind? Yeah, that blew my mind because, like you said, when I got out there and I looked at it, I was like, wow, there's a lot of young people out there that ain't going to know what the hell we're doing. With you. And uh, the appreciation, like you said, it blew my mind. But... Uh, that was the, once again, that was another intent of starting Ultra Magnetic. We wanted to do something that had his own signature on it. And I think by putting the, our own stamp on it, that's what made it timeless. Uh, see, if, when you do things and you try to conform, what you do is you lock yourself into an era. And the fact that we weren't trying to do that, that we were trying to do something that made somebody go, not, oh, that sounds like Rakim, you know, or even though Rakim, when he came out, he made people go, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just coming out doing what people expected. So we didn't want to do what people were expecting. Like back then, the rhymes were pretty simple. I met a girl named Sally from the valley. You know, and the names were simple. The rappers were screaming. So you had Rakim come out. He was talking. You had Ultra come out. They weren't rhyming at all. So it was just a phase that took hip hop into another tier and also led to even what's happening now because it basically took the rules off of the game. You know, there was no rules. Like Rakim even took it to the point to where uh, he even did his vocals sitting down. You know, I, I heard him say in an interview that he had to argue with Marley because Marley wanted him to stand up and do the vocals. But, but see, there is no rules. You you should be able to do vocals if you can lay down. It's, it's not it's not your position is what's coming out of your mouth. So if you can lay down and execute, then that's good. You know, but everybody. Everybody in life, we have these unseen rules and we act like it applies to everything. Like even with chopping samples, uh, I remember one session uh, I was doing when we did bait, something had a musical note on it and the engineer was like, oh, we can't use it, it has a note on it. And then I said, watch this. And you know, put the beat together and the sh shit sounded fly. He was just like, see, Everybody makes these unseen rules 
And that's what Keith was able to do with lyrically. He took the unseen rules away. And I did it musically. And that's why it's timeless. Like, there's no rules on those albums. Yeah. yeah. And look, when you look at the era in which you guys, you know, really were coming up out of, you know, people can make their debates that the 90s were the golden era, 80s were the golden era. But I feel like the most eclectic palette of artists was existing sometime between 85 and 90. And you guys were operating within that. So when you would think about, I don't know, competition, if you looked at any of these people as competition, who was the biggest competition to you guys you felt? Uh, everybody was competition. That's, that's, that's the difference between today and now. I mean, today and back then. Back then, everybody was competition. Uh, the next record could leapfrog everybody. Because once again, everybody was unique. Whereas today, everybody's basically doing the same. So now it just comes down to the top level, the top echelon of everybody who's doing the same shit. Whereas when we did it, you know, you had Dana telling stories. KRS was a criminal, but an educator. Mm. Rakim was deep. Ultra was scientific. Kane was metaphors. You, everybody had their own lane. Kid and Play was happy. See, today, everybody's the same thing. So that's why you only have a few people competing. Whereas you have so many different lanes. Like, we'll be doing all of this, and then Kid and Play will come out of the way with a happy record and pass everybody. You know, this is how it was. This is what it was. So everybody was competition. Yeah, it was it was such an interesting thing to watch. I always would get excited, like looking at you know, like Yo and uh, you know, Rap Masters and Word Up, and you know, you know, it was easy. It's so easy to be a fan of everybody, and like hip hop was just so super serving. Now it's just like overwhelming. And you're right, a lot of people are doing the same things, and you guys kind of came out, carved your own lane, and broke the mold. Um, you know, in addition from the rhyming space, you know, we talked earlier about production. You know, there's a lot of uh, uncredited work that you have in the BDP space. And, uh, you know, even, you know, going back to Karis One, shouting you out on uh, Out of Here, you know? Like, you know, how did you and Chris meet? And how did that lead to you guys ended up in a studio working? Well, once again, uh, it was by accident. Uh, they had heard about my brother and keyboard money, Mike. They came to the house, Chris and his old group. And Scott and me grew up on the west side. Scott and Rock. And his girl lived in the next building. So Scott was coming up regularly. And he happened to be the uh, supervisor of that man shelter KRS was staying in. He didn't know Chris was even in there. Mm -hmm. Until my brother, when Scott expressed that he was looking for a rapper, and my brother, you know, told him about uh, Chris and them because Chris was in the man shelter he was working. He said, this guy works right in the space you at. So Scott came up, he peeped the group, but he only wanted Chris. And then, like I said, what happened was Keyboard Money Mike was doing production, but Mike was musical. You know, he's not bad. He was musical. You know, he just liked to put a lot of chords, and rap was hard at that time. Mm -hmm. So they would just give me their ideas, and I would just hook it up my way. That's how that came about. <laughs> Classic records under the belt. Uh, you know, you co-produced a lot on the Criminal Reminded album. Got to work with the legendary Paul C on the Ultra Magnetics uh, first album. Now, Paul C is a name that if you know, you know. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, you know, he's not a household name to everybody. You know, what was it, you know, what was Paul C like for somebody who never got a chance to meet him? Paul was unique that uh, he was like this old, this old, uh, so-called white cat who used to uh, work at this uh, record store at, on 42nd Street called the Music Factory. Their knowledge of records exceeded their so-called cultural limitations as far as funk music. Like uh, you would go in the Music Factory and you would hum a beat. And you know how people hum, it don't even sound like the record. Manny, Manny would know the record. 
and Paul Paul's extension, his his musical collection and stuff like that was just like shocking for you know for his cultural differences. And that was the, the most amazing thing. And and what made Paul unique was that uh he wasn't a regular engineer. Like this is one of the reasons why I stopped doing the engineering. Uh, cause when people come in with their projects, unfortunately, nine out of ten of those projects are gonna be whack. So now you're sitting up there tormenting yourself listening to all this whackness, you know, and you're trying to fight through it. But then what happens, what really discourages you is that, you know, the, the artist will think like something you're going to do by putting the echo on time is going to make the record a hit. <laughs> this shit is whack. You, know? you have all the echo, whatever you want, this is whack. But Paul wouldn't just sit through that. He would just stop it and do a whole new project for, for those people who were paying him. That's what made Paul unique. He had a good heart. You know, whereas most people say, okay, I'm going to do a beat, but you know, you got to pay me X, Y, Z, da, da, da. Paul would just do it. Yeah, like, you, know, you see his name on so many credits, man, and you hear so much post. Because even like, being as nerdy as I am about the culture, I would hear the shout outs on the records and I was one of those guys who always would read the liner notes. And then like, you know, as I got older, as I read about what happened to Paul, he's like, well, damn, you know what I mean? And it's one of those like hip hop cases that still remain unsolved to this day. And it's just, you know, tragic because you always think about what could have been, you know, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, also a rest in peace to your comrade, Tim Dog as well. You know, another legendary, uh, you know, such an interesting time in, in rap, it, you know, when, you know, and being a Bronx guy, I always rooted for the home team. So when Tim Dog came out with Fuck Compton, I was like, okay, yeah, Fuck Compton. Even though I got my Raiders hat on, I was all about it, man. What was the process like, you know, working with him on that? Well, once again, that wasn't any of our idea. <laughs> uh, I was aggressively shopping Tim because he had just came off of doing a uh, chorus line and he had a good street buzz. So I said, okay, I can get you a deal now. So I took Tim to uh, Next Plateau. Yeah, he was shopping uh, Step to me. And Eddie O'Loughlin, as you can tell from Ultra, there's no real cursing on our album, no cursing on Salt and Pepper. So when I took Tim into uh, Eddie O'Loughlin, every time a curse would come on the record, Eddie was gone. <laughs> turned red he said Cedric that's just too hard for this label so then a friend of mine he was over at Uptown Records uh, Management his name was Kurt Woodley we called him Kurt Juice he had just got the uh, head A&R job over at uh, Sony Rough House Records so I took it over to Sony and Kurt was like yeah, yeah, yo, yo, I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna, we're gonna lock this deal down. You're gonna take Tim, you're gonna put him on a beat similar to Chorus Line, and you're gonna diss the motherfuckers from the West Coast. So I went back, said, Tim, this is what you gotta do, write that. And we did it. They gave us a demo deal budget. We went in, we cut it, got it signed, and the rest is history number one rap record in Billboard, two months. Uh, number one video on the old box where people have to call in and pay for the video to be shown. I those days. Pay for the video to be shown. Number one on the box for two months. Yo, that's what it is. I really wish they would bring the box back because, you know, we got YouTube and that's cool and all, but sometimes, you know, you go on YouTube and you only look for things that you know exist versus, you know, seeing yeah, what that's, people are into. That's why the box won't come back because you have to pay for the video. See, nobody pays today. They just go online and they get everything free. I know. They pay. See, these people listen to me. They paid to watch the video. <laughs> and it was number one for two months. That's how big this record was. All right? Yo, times have changed a lot, man. So, you know, bringing us all the way to 2020, and I know there's a lot in between, but I feel like we can come back together at some point and pick up the rest of the story. Delta Five, 
Uh, it's the new single. The video's fun as hell, too. Uh, like, yo, they gave y'all carte blanche territory up in the airport. I don't know. Was that even in America where y'all were at? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that was that was Shan hookup. I think she she knows somebody, you know, up, up in the executive room. Like, I was going, are you sure we can go up there? <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely a phenomenal look, um, you know, and, and the record is dope, man. Classic said G. Uh, as, a, as a fan of the Delta Force trilogy, right, uh, I, I found Delta Force 1 and 2. Did we score? Where is three and four? Like I like I've looked in the catalog. I couldn't find three and four. Well, three is on the best kept secret album. Okay. And four is on the uh what what I call this? Uh Set G's Future of the Breaks album. Future of the Break. You can find it's actually an album with all instrumentals except that one track. Okay. I'm gonna look I'm gonna find Oh, yeah, you can find that on Bandcamp. Okay, I thought yeah. you let it part six us. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, hey, what happened yeah. to let us part one through five? But, but okay. Yo, but you know, the video is fine. And like, in pocket with the time. You know what I mean? Like, you know, some guys who've been around for a long time doing it, they get rusty. But that's one thing I can say about you and Keith, man. Y'all always kept the concepts moving forward. You know, I can't even tell you what year this sounds, you know, this record sounds like. And then the B side at the end of the video, Gorillas, is also a vibe too. They need to get Cool Keith on Dancing with the Stars. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Keith directed the video too. Yo, Keith you know, no one does a gorilla video like Keith, man. Yeah, Keith directed both of the videos, you know. That's Keith always, uh, all the videos we do, Keith has directed all of them. Like, like uh, he creatively, he just knows what he's doing when it comes to those things. Mm -hmm. So when he say, okay, that scene, you know, like I'll add in, but basically it'll always be, he take the road on it. Like, okay, start there, boom, 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 boom. Got you. Well, yo, a phenomenal piece of work. Uh, a side and B side is great. When do we get a full entree? Uh, you have to ask the executor, Sharon. You is know, it already she, in the bag or yeah. we still cooking? Yeah, yeah, it's in the bag. It's in the bag. If the cake is done, you know, we're going to put the icing on it and we're going to put it in the box and we're waiting for the executor, <laughs> Sharon, <laughs> you know, the, the launch. So that's on her. All right, man. Well, I you know, I can't thank you guys enough for continuing to feed the culture as long as you guys have been doing it. It's, it's truly a labor of love, man. I know, you know, sometimes you, know, you can tell when someone is really passionate about the art, the way you guys are, because like, yo, no matter what's going on in the world, whether it's an ultra project, whether it's a Keith Solo project, whether it's a hybrid of all the things, or like a new group, you know, we can always get something from the camp and it's dope. When you think about all the places that you've toured, Seth, uh, what has probably been like the craziest tour story that you could tell us, you know, whether it's something recent or even back in the day? Uh, it still has to be the first time we went to London. Uh, when me and Keith hit the stage, the crowd was making so much noise that we literally couldn't hear the monitors on the stage. It was just organized confusion. And when you watch the tape, like Tim Westwood had taped it, he was a DJ big on Capitol Radio out there in London for the people who don't know. He taped it, he videoed it. And you're watching the video and me and Keith is off beat. But the crowd is going crazy. So people who weren't there, they don't understand. Like they probably was watching going, and they going crazy. These motherfuckers is off beat. <laughs> <laughs> but you couldn't hear the monitors. You couldn't hear nothing. They were just going crazy. The moment we stepped out there, we had some light up glasses on. You know, we always did the lights, there's nothing new. We've always done that. And the crowd went crazy. Mo Love threw on Bob James Nautilus. We came out there and it was just chaos. Yo, 
you know, overseas, man, they 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 appreciate the culture so much, man. And, and like, it's it's almost like a time capsule. Like, you know, anytime I've had the privilege of like, you know, going over there or even seeing other people's performances from there, it's like it's new to them still. You know what I mean? Like, there's sometimes so many times as a New Yorker, I go to see shows in New York because I don't live there no more, thinking it's gonna be a better experience because like, oh, this is home base. They're gonna give it up. And sometimes it's a little underwhelming because you expect the love to be more than what it is because it's the birthplace. It's kind of weird sometimes. You know, it's like anything. Uh, if you're overfed something, it loses appreciation. Like if you love chicken, but if you eat chicken, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, meal in between meal for a week, you don't appreciate the chicken. So New York is just that they get shows all the time. Most of your rappers come from New York. So it's not that they don't appreciate, it's just they've seen it before. Yeah. Whereas when you take it overseas, they don't see it. So they appreciate it. But now doing this uh plan, I mean pandemic, uh people will appreciate it because it's been taken away. I think so, that's, you know, probably the brightest side of all this situation. Like, you know, the first, man, the first six months, everybody getting back out there, man, yo, the energy is going to be phenomenal, man. People are going to be going up. Well, can't wait for the uh, executives and the people who are over the project Delta 5 to give the green light so we can get that thing. Yo, said, much love to you. Thank you for all you've contributed to the culture. Like, you know, like this is me bowing and, and bigging you up, man. Wow. You know? Yo, it's the it's the love of the arts, man. That they, they, they keep us going, and you know, it just sometimes you just gotta hear a certain song to take you out of a dark place. And you guys have crafted a few of those, man. And you taught us how to have fun, man. Thanks, man. Yo, so don't stop, man. That brother right there, he go by the name of Said G. Delta Five is the video and the single out now. It is streaming everywhere you are streaming your music from. And if you want to see a dope ass video. Possibly shot illegally at an airport. You want to check out the video on YouTube. <laughs> 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 Much love, Sam. Peace, y'all. Peace.